guests and all those in attendance. Greeting, Andrea. It's good to see you. Um, welcome to day two of a robustly and thought-provoking virtual symposium. I just want to extend our gratitude to um, Professor Adam Abib yesterday, who actually kick-started the program. And I got excited when I, I heard about his vision on internationalization. And I just, I just thought to myself, we were also visionary from the School of Social Sciences when we strategically chose uh, SOAS as our strategic partner for internationalization. Um, I would like to extend our gratitude um, to, the, to the SOAS convening team, um, Dr. Angelica Bashira, Dr. Kai Estin, Dr. Wayne Doe, and all the technical team, thank you so much for pulling in your resources, both soft and hard skills, and also at the fact that you um, almost single-handedly, um, from a technological perspective, you've pulled this through for us. We are grateful. My sincere gratitude goes to my colleague and the academic leader for, for research in the School of Social Sciences, and also the champion for internationalization, Professor Maheshri Naidu, who um, tirelessly has um, been committed to our internationalization uh, uh, vision. I remember when I stepped into the deanery of social sciences um, in 2019, and I sat with how looking at the vision, our vision for internationalization, and we decided through her search and uh, for, through our search and we chose SWAS. We had planned to travel together. We actually booked uh, to travel together in October, but unfortunately I was unwell. And so she traveled and connected and initiated this collaboration. And I'm so grateful to her. Colleagues, to be honest, towards the end of uh, 2020, she had a, a, a personal family loss and I, was, I panicked a bit because I was not sure she was going to uh, be able to pull herself back into academic uh, work. So I'm so grateful and, and thankful to her. I also want to, to, to record um, our thanks to our college, the support that we've received from the College of Humanities at UKZ and to the leadership of uh, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Glangra Mikise, who welcomed you all yesterday. And also we are grateful for the support that we're receiving from the office of our own vice chancellor, Professor Nana Poko. Colleagues, the devastation of a COVID-19 pandemic cannot be understated. In the same breath, many of the people gathered here today may not have been able to travel to London or Devon had this, not been, had this been a traditional symposium. Academics, I can tell you, they love to travel. Uh, because it had forced us the opportunity to network, learn of new spaces, and be informed of other people's lived experiences, albeit a fleeting dis as fleeting distant observers. I hope we'll be able to do this even on this restricted virtual platform in order for us to continue our engagement beyond these two dates. When we set out to establish this relationship between SWAS and the School of Social Sciences at UKZN, we were driven by ambitions that form the centerpiece of our internationalization strategy. The aim is not to count an unending tally of partnerships and collaborations around the world. Ours is to have targeted, meaningful, and enriching engagements across the globe with schools and all departments that have shared values, intellectual rigor, and scholarly commitment to what we do. The world, as you know, has been democratizing at rapid rates. And over the past uh, 60 years or so, with noteworthy possible regression over the last decade. This has necessitated demands for freedom. These are closely linked to questions of being and becoming, identity and authenticity, justice and humanity, just to name a few. These 
our inaugural symposium, and we already sized with these critical existential questions. These phenomenological experiences form our initiation to life, and we carry them across our professional, familiar, social, political, and other spaces of our lives. The SOAS and UKZM partnership straddles, straddles the delicate balance between what we have come to know as the global south and the global north. There can be no contested spaces than this. Critical questions are posed on the production of knowledge, contested meanings of epistemology, ontology, and existence, given the varied lenses of observation that often lead to contested narratives. This symposium will not make us adopt a one size fit all approach to scholarship and knowledge production, but it must help us perceive the world differently, approach our work with greater nuance, as we appreciate lessons learned from engaging with knowledge views that may not have been as robust and frank without this collaborative effort between SOAS and UKZN. As a School of Social Sciences, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, we pursue our collaborations informed by our context, locality, and extensive work that transcends the limitations of our borders. Three major themes drive our work, migration and African archives, gender and decoloniality, and Africanization and curricula. For this reason, senior academics and emerging scholars have been blended into this symposium from our side, taking, taking advantage of the present while building for the future. Decolonization features heavily in the aspirations of contemporary generation when reflecting on the future of academia. We must not embrace this agitation habitually to simply hijack the discourse because that will breed further cynicism on the inability of our institutions to transform towards a space that embraces the collective experience of those who walk through our various campus gates and doors. For this MOU, for, for this MOU, we focus on mobility for our School of Social Sciences postdoctoral fellows and staff exchanges meant to enhance the curriculum and teaching of African studies at SOAS through sustained contact with scholars and narratives of the African continent. SOAS has a rich history dating back to 1916 when it was founded. Six years, six years after the Natal University College was founded in 1910, on our Peter Marisbeck campus. By age, we are contemporaries. And by vision, we are aligned acutely. And um, this may not always have been the case. And um, most of you will know. As UKZN, our history is steeped in logics of contest and colonialism, with the statue of King George the Fifth standing studiously before our Howard College building, named after the son of T.B. Davis. Our histories are marred by those who came before us. We take great comfort in the fact that the renowned advocate for children, women, and human rights, Mrs. Grasha Marshall, the wife of our former late president, Nelson Mandela, is the president of SWAS. It gives us both intuitive and, and perceptive comfort. There is no doubt in my mind that we will mutually benefit from this collaborative arrangement. SWAS, according to the 2020 Q, um, QS World University Ranking has performed remarkably in some areas as top ranking subjects include development studies at equal sixth position up from eight in 2019, anthropology at equal 13 from 16 in 2019, and politics at 18 from up from 23rd in 2019. Um, notwithstanding the rich uh, leadership laid down by the likes of Valerie Amos, and African curriculum at SWAS. We believe that our MOU is not um, simply North-South. UKZN and the School of Social Sciences as an institution of the South have much to offer SWAS in further offering staff and intellectual resources to deepen their African curriculum and programs. SWAS has an international student body and has resources to send students to UKZN on short-term fieldwork intensive and immersion in African sites beyond abstract engagement. We don't see our MOU with SWAS as mutually beneficial with social sciences able to offer SWAS intellectual capital as, we, as well as um, collaborative growth with SWAS. 
So colleagues and guests, with these few words, I hope that our second day of this virtual symposium will lead to much knowledge exchange accompanied by important connections that will enable us to collaborate even much more in the future. You are all welcome and thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just um, hand over to my, to my colleague, Andrea. Thank you so much. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much, Vivian. And thank you so much for such an inspiring um, opening and also for all, saying all the thank yous. So I'd also like to echo those thanks. Um, and I'd also like to echo um, just the, the wonderful feeling it is to be able to build on this partnership that's newly been established between two institutions, as you say, um, born around the same time um, and with so much in common uh, and so many people in common who've traveled between these institutions over this time and colleagues who have uh, sitting in this, uh, in this Zoom room uh, with long and deep connections um, with South Africa. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to be here to, to open uh, day two and to be able to be here as much as possible during the day on a set of issues that are so important for us to talk about um, in these moments. And I think it's good to give pause also to think about what is meant for us at SOAS to decolonize ourselves given our history. So being set up in, in 1916 to serve the empire, um, we have a particular uh, responsibility as an institution to decolonize everything that we do, to decolonize our teaching, to decolonize our practices, our pedagogy, and also to decolonize our research. And I think you know something that's been uh, really powerful at SOAS in recent years, since we adopted our decolonizing vision in 2017, and spearheaded discussions in the UK on decolonizing the curriculum, which came from student mobilization and student mobilization and student engagement at SOAS in shaping some of the issues that we've dealt with has been really, really key. Um, I come myself from a background of having been an undergraduate student of African studies in SOAS uh, in the late 1980s and early 90s, and part of those kind of student uh, protests and student kind of engagement, shaking things up and bringing new ideas. Um, so it's something that's been very valuable to us. And so those students in, who came to, to remind us of the need for us to really think very seriously about how we taught Africa and how we frame African studies led to us adopting a decolonizing vision in 2017. And then last December, we adopted a decolonizing research vision, which sets a very assertive path towards really dealing differently with partnerships with the Global South. So along with uh, Professor Habib, um, I'm very committed as the Pro-Director for Research and Enterprise to building a very different kind of partnership than the kinds of partnerships we've seen um, between Northern institutions and Southern institutions um, in the past, where Southern institutions haven't had a seat at the table when the budgets are defined, when the, uh, the, the shapes of the researcher are defined, um, when the theoretical work is produced. And so in the partnership with KwaZulu-Natal and the work that we'll build around that, um, we have a very, very strong commitment to co-equal partnership, to learning from you and learning um, how to be able to do partnership better, but also working really as mutual partners, uh, rather than I think uh, thinking in the old style of partnerships between the UK and, and uh, institutions in the global south in that frame of internationalization, which hasn't been so much a co-equal partnership. And I speak more broadly for SOAS's desire to do this um, with other partners as well, uh, and to build a new way of working with the Global South, um, led by Adam's very inspiring vision. And um, something else to say about SOAS, I think, is that the long and deep tradition of African studies at SOAS is something that many people from South Africa, and I'm sure from KwaZulu-Natal, have also been part of our debates at SOAS and have come to SOAS as visiting fellows. And so that long period of exchange is also the really basis for building a strong institutional strategic partnership because it counts on people getting to know each other. And I think, as you said, Vivian, you know, we love to travel um, and to network and to get to know people. And in these Zoom times, we can reach a bigger audience and people can have a virtual experience of getting to know each other. But once we're able to physically meet each other again, uh, we can have some of those exchanges as well. And so part of building that partnership is a really broad ranging set of activities that we can develop together. And I'd love to see us building a research infused teaching co-program together where we're able to deliver material together in our different classrooms and the students to think together about some of the issues with that kind of critical disruptive thinking uh, that our students can bring that keep us on our toes. I'd like to see our scholars developing collaborative programs where they co-research and plan together um, work that they can, they can do together. And I think there's so much to build on. There's so many commonalities between our institutions and the questions 
that we're asking the critical questions about epistemology, about space, about power. Um, and I can see, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of other possibilities for early career scholars and PhD students, uh, split site PhD scholarships, opportunities for young scholars to move and to work together um, and to, to develop and to be mentored across our institutions by scholars from each other's institutions. So there are all kinds of research related um, dimensions to that partnership, um, which I can see being very exciting for us to be able to develop. Um, and so with that, you know, with those words, I think um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a good moment to sort of open up now for the, the sessions um, and to pass over to, I think, to Angelica. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, I'll now pass it on to Vivian, who is a chair in the keynote with Professor Francis Nyamjo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank you, Angelica. And one, welcome once more, um, uh, guest colleagues, to our uh, keynote conversation uh, with Professor Nyamjo Francis. Um, in, 19, uh, in 1994, when I registered um, as an undergraduate student in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the University of uh, University of Goya, Cameroon, I, I, I remember vividly the first face I met was uh, Professor Nyamjo Francis, and he, he doesn't seem to have changed that much. Um, he's decided to stay young, and we've caught up with him. And I'm grateful to be sharing this platform. For me, I've grown to know him as, um, as a mentor and an academic father. I've learned so much. I drink from his world a lot. Almost every publication, major publication, major, major presentation he makes, he will slip it through my email and calls me, colleague, I'm sharing this with you, my colleague. And I, a part of me was saying now, say, no, this is, this is your father. It's not a colleague, it's your mentor. Um, and he has allowed me to grow um, in that way with my own, not forcing me to reason like him because I'm a feminist, um, but always teasing me <laughs> around my thinking. So um, I, I just, I'll take this opportunity just to tell you a bit about him before we get into the conversation, just to say that he's a professor of social anthropology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa since um, August 2009. He's a recipient of the ASFAC 2018 Fetch and Olive and Oliver Prize for the best monograph for his book, Roads Must Fall, Nibbling at Resilient Colonialism in South Africa. He is a B1 rated professor and researcher by the South African National Research Foundation, NRF. Also a fellow of the Cameroon Academy of Science since August 2011. He's also a fellow of the, Afri of the African Academy of Science since December 2014. He's also a fellow of the Academy of Science of South Africa since 2016. He served as head of publications for the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, CODESRA, from July 2003 to July 2009. His research and interest centers around issues of citizenship, cultural and political identity making, social shaping of information and communication technologies. Um, honestly, uh, uh, participants, um, someone of uh, Professor Nyamjo Francis's caliber does not really need an introduction in the academy. Um, I would like to humbly invite you to this conversation, Professor Nyamjo Francis. I'm delighted to be the one uh, teasing you and provoking you so that we can, we can drink, we can, we can learn as much and you can share with us your ideas. We've read, we've read from your books, um, we've read from your articles, but at this point, uh, I would really like to, I would like to us to engage in a way that we give the audience enough time to pose their questions and I'd rather they speak directly with you than us following the traditional pattern of listening and listening. We've heard quite a lot, but this is an opportunity for the audience. Those who have not had the opportunity in the past to speak and, and, and ask you direct questions, 
to do so. So I'll kickstart this conversation, uh, 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 Professor Nyamjo, by asking you what, what, in your opinion, is the role of mobility in knowledge production? Thanks very much, uh, Vivian. It's always a pleasure to uh, converse with you, formally and informally. And thanks to all present. Uh, uh, this uh, initiative is clearly a model for the future. Although COVID has given us a lot of nightmares, it has also introduced some creativity in how we do uh, 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 on, uh, our conversations on knowledge and knowledge production. Uh, that said, I, I would like uh, just to emphasize that first, the, the idea of producing knowledge and new knowledge at, the, at that uh, presupposes a certain idea or recognition uh, that what we know and what we have at our disposal uh, uh, currently is incomplete. So underpinning the, the, our quests for production of knowledge is the idea of incompleteness and the need to enhance ourselves through reaching out, exploring new avenues and so on. So uh, 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 this incompleteness pushes us to be mobile. And uh, mobile uh, in terms of our curiosities, in terms of our quests, mobile also in terms of uh, physical mobility, the, 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 the need to reach out and compress time and space through our nimble footedness, uh, the need to, 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 to shape our, speaking at the level of individuals, uh, uh, individual researchers, our physical being to embody, to, to respond to the world out there. Uh, that we have created and that we, res we, we re re relate to uh, in a way that we embody it and we're able to mobilize our being to uh, react when such uh, uh, knowledge or such embodiment is called uh, 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 into, into play. So you see that mobility is central uh, because of our recognition and the provision for the fact of incompleteness, either as individual beings, as uh, knowledge producing institutions, as cultural communities, as whatever. Uh, and so mobility therefore is uh, key and uh, uh, without it, we would, uh, we would not be alive, uh, it, it, literally, either as, a, as beings or as, as cultural systems or as knowledge production traditions. Uh, the, 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 the need to, to, to be mobile is a way of discovering, it's a technology or, or for, for discovering uh, ourselves and uh, uh, taking ourselves out to encounter others, whether this is nature, fellow humans, and, uh, and so on. And, and, and finally, we do need uh, uh, to be mobile in ways that uh, suit the challenges of the moment, various technologies of self-extension. And such technologies might just be ideas that we ventilate through books, through uh, the, uh, the, the knowledge we produce. Uh, it might be uh, 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 various gadgets, your smartphone, the, the fact of this Zoom that makes it possible for us to be mobile even as we are firmly grounded. <laughs> I in Cape Town, you in, in Durban and others in London and many other parts of the world. So mobility is central to knowledge production. And the ideas that we produce are nimble footed. They move around even when we seek to confine them. So uh, once we have had it out there, there's no way of keeping them back. And just to, uh, to, to, to end, in, in the grass fields of Cameroon, where I come from, you, I know you come from, from, from the uh, by, 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 uh, Manu area, but I come from the grass fields, I'm sure you have similar proverbs where, where you are based. There's a sense in that uh, one person's child is only in the womb. 
which basically uh, encapsulates the idea of mobility right from the time that even before we are born, of course. Uh, and uh, so we need to, to see mobility in, a, in, in, in its complexities, not just the, the, the social interactions and uh, uh, the, uh, the, but how we, we, we get uh, domesticated into the context into which we, we are born and so on. And uh, there's a colleague of ours here who does wonderful work on ideas of mobilities right from the early childhood. And that is Fiona Ross and the program is called The First Thousand Days. Uh, so you can see our investment in mobility as central to being and becoming and to knowledge production. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, uh, uh, Professor um, Nyamjo. I I'm glad that you, 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 did, you did state that uh, um, as people move around or as we both physically and virtually, uh, knowledge, is being, uh, knowledge is being produced. For us at this moment, one of the major, and, and this is one of the reasons why we are gathered through this virtual symposium, is to uh, engage in the project we have termed decolonization. So I, I would like you to, to tell us what your understanding of decolonization is. What's your yeah. position? Yes, I, I think if, if you go back to what I said about incompleteness uh, that pushes us to be mobile and uh, mobility leads to various encounters with, with others, mobile others, incomplete mobile others, uh, then in the meeting of these uh, uh, mobilities, various incompletenesses, all circulating around the world, circulating in various ways, guises and disguises. We reach to, if we open up to a certain sense of compositeness of our being, because when you are mobile and you encounter mobile orders, it rubs off in one way or another. And then uh, uh, this, uh, and, and, and uh, if it rubs off, then you, you take what has rubbed off you as a trophy of sorts back home. And therefore, there's a certain sense of debt and indebtedness to those you have encountered in your mobility and uh, to, to the incomplete orders that you have encountered in your mobility. And, they, and, and that debt and indebtedness uh, uh, creates all sorts of possibilities. Some recognize the debt, some don't, and it has implications. So what I would say, therefore, about decolonization is about drawing attention to a particular idea of mobility and counters, uh, uh, not as a zero-sum game of winner takes all, but as a much more accommodating convivial uh, uh, engagement with one another because nobody has the, 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 the monopoly of incompleteness. And because ultimately the quest for completeness is a very, uh, the quest for violence, inflicts a lot of violence on those you encounter. It's a very violent project. So my, my idea of decolonization would therefore be uh, 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 the process of recognizing and providing for incompleteness through our mobility and encounters with others. The process of celebrating our compositeness of being. And it should be a process at the center of which is recognizing and providing for debt and indebtedness. And basically that sort of decolonization leads to recognize to, to, to a convivial disposition arrangement in the academy and in the area of knowledge production. And such conviviality is uh, uh, what I, I would term convivial scholarship. So decolonization in short, as incomplete beings and incomplete institutions and incomplete civilizations and societies interacting with one another is providing for convivial scholarship. Thank you. Thank you so much. As I listen to you um, explaining the meaning of mobility and knowledge production and decolonization, I am very happy and, and relieved that we chose you as um, the appropriate um, keynote speaker for this, uh, for this session. 
also because I like when I started, I I I I I told you I first met you in 1994 in an anthropology class. <laughs> and um by 2003, you went off to Kenya, to 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 Kenya and no, no, to no, no, no. Uh, 2000 and uh, 1999, I went to Botswana. Yeah. Oh yes, I forgot yeah. that part. I'm so sorry. You went off to the University of Botswana, and then in 2003, you moved to, to, to Kodesha. And when I was looking for you at some point, I realized you've been appointed as the, the head of anthropo social anthropology at the University of Cape Town. Now, my question to you, looking at, looking at the place of knowledge production and mobility and how we in the South, we engaging with the issue of decolonization, I would like you to, to illustrate the place of mobility and decolonization from your own personal trajectory. Absolutely. I mean, it's so obvious, isn't it? I told you about mobility, starting from the very idea of motion, coordinated movement when a child is born and uh, you reach out, you have your system, the neurosciences at play, balancing and being able to use your legs, use different parts of your, your body, adopt to the cultural context in which you are called upon to act and interact with others. Uh, uh, that, that, that one, a child that starts their life with such baby steps, as I started in Cameroon from the grass field that I referred to, following the logic of one person's child is only in the womb. Or if you didn't want overly to dramatize the grass fields, you could go to China Achebe and the idea of the world being like a dancing masquerade. If you want to watch it well, you have to keep pace with the dance and be able to document it like that. And I'm sure your idea of decolonization is about uh, knowing that the world is nimble footed and good researchers and good collaborators, including Adam Abib, who is now nimble footedly gone to SWAS after the experience that he had here at, 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 in WISA, you know, in, uh, at BITS, means that basically you have to see how this mobility that is central to each and every one of us, each and every knowledge system, each and every ontology and epistemology should be allowed to rise and blossom. And I think that my own personal trajectory, modest as it is, is evidence of that. Incompleteness leads to quest, Question leads to all sorts of mobilities of various kinds, took me to the, uh, Botswana, uh, you, you've not mentioned the UK where I got my PhD and so on and so forth, took me to Senegal, took, taking me here and it, I remain an open ended until even when I'm six feet deep, I continue to be mobile. It's not going to end there. I'm going to be mobilized by people who, if you live, you, you, you outlive me, you will continue to mobilize your memories of your associations with me and draw me out of the grave to help you resolve some problems uh, that you continue to encounter. So mobility is eternal. I, in my own nimble footedness, is an example of that, but this is by no means a, a unique thing. Everybody has a lot of many stories to tell. And my writings, actually point to that, that instead of us imposing one meta narrative, one way of seeing and doing in a zero sum fashion or winner takes all, we should open up to all these multiplicities of influences thanks to our mobility uh, and uh, be able to enrich our academy, decolonize accordingly, change curricula by co collaborating between the university and uh, people from outside of the academy. And, and that is why I write the books I do. Uh, the book, uh, 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 Drinking from the Cosmic God, How Amos Tutola Can Change Our Minds, an example of that. Amos, Amos Tutola, in many ways, was considered a freak creature, a freak writer, not accepted in the academy, even where we thought he should be celebrated, because he had dared to write with a language he did not master. We should reach out and bring those people into the academy to tell the stories that enrich our theorization, our practice, our teaching. That is what it means to have an inclusive, uh, exciting uh, curriculum, a university as knowledge production informed by a meeting, a confluence of incompletenesses. No one thinking that uh, they, 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 they are more, uh, 
more complete than the others. Thank you so much. Um, distilling then from your sense of decolonization, what is the way forward for knowledge production? The way forward mm -hmm. is precisely what I called for, a sort of scholarship that is convivial in the sense that if we are determined to operate according to discipline, this discipline should be starting point, but they shouldn't be limiting. They shouldn't close off the borders where we begin to celebrate mediocrity instead of breaking uh, new grounds and new areas. D discipline should be springboards that enable us to reach for the skies, but with our feet firmly on the ground. And that means a certain openness, a certain disposition, a certain humility. In, 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 in our knowledge practices, in our knowledge production. We shouldn't be afraid to encounter and be enriched by others. And we shouldn't bury such enrichments under the carpet by assuming that we are taller than who we are, by pretending that we are self-made in our knowledge production, by refusing to acknowledge those who have pointed us in the right direction and so on and so forth. So convivial scholarship is a scholarship informed by the constants and permanence of incompleteness, not as a negative, but as a, a, an attribute, a disposition uh, uh, that, that makes our, sharpens our urge for inquiries and, and, and keeps us always uh, 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 moving around excitedly like, like a dancing masquerade and having new stories to tell with every excursion. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I know that over the years I have tried to drag you um, and, and, and tease you a bit on um, feminist work and we've never really agreed. And I've also tried, I've, I'm a good student um, and tried not to argue so much with your mentor. So, but if we have to listen to you, if we if we have to ask you, uh, those of us who are engaged in, say, an example um, of, of feminist research, how, distilling from what you have said, how, how would you apply feminist uh, research as an example, based on everything that you have said? Absolutely. Uh, incompleteness is the key here. And a disposition to learn by taking your your incompleteness out to be sampled by other incompletenesses and enriched accordingly is what uh, makes a humble and exciting knowledge producer. So a knowledge producer shouldn't have any preconditions except a commitment to inquiry, to quest, and uh, to uh, scientific truth. And, and that basically means that uh, 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 if you find a factor that applies in the context where a category that applies to the context where you are producing knowledge, say race, uh, gen uh, uh, gender, uh, uh, geography, class, and others that apply, you bring them in. You do not say uh, now the only thing that matters is class, uh, no race, no ethnicity, nothing. The only thing that matters is sexuality no other things that uh, and so on. So forth. I think uh, that picking and choosing might be relevant for focusing and pointing attention in a strategic essentialist fashion to silences in our knowledge production process. But that shouldn't mean silencing alternatives. So basically my incompleteness uh, model would do justice to feminist scholarship by uh, uh, critical, uh, critically uh, uh, interrogating such a uh, 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 ways of doing scholarship informed by various dominances and, and assumptions of superiority, such as patriarchy and matriarchy. Uh, and, and I think that is really uh, what uh, I, 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 how, what I celebrate in feminist scholarship, this disposition to point attention to new, exciting new ways of, of, of theorizing and analyzing things that are supposed to make the academy much more inclusive and uh, our, our intellectual project and theories much more reflective of the complexity and nuance of the nimble-footed dancing masquerade. Thank you so much, um, Professor Nyamjo. I think like we have been um, 
it's important here for us to allow the the audience and participants to engage with you. And I, I from the Q and A from the Q and A um, section here, I've got a couple of questions, and I think we have enough time for us to engage in most of them. And we're hoping that you'll be able to circulate um, the presentation in case we're not able to answer all of this and. We'll be able to send your email address to those who may have questions and that probably a time will not permit us to take the questions. So um, I know greetings, Francis. I know you have a long thought about, you have long thought about mobility from many angles. I find a way in which you have linked mobility and the production of knowledge. You mentioned mobility and incomplete knowledge. I, I think the person, men incompleteness, not com incomplete knowledge, but you may correct me if I'm wrong. This raises a question that I would like you to expand on. Are we always in a state of incompleteness that pushes us always to be mobile? Absolutely. Uh, I think I'm not being able to see the question because I don't want to, be, to distract since you are, you are cheering, but that's a, that is a great question. We are always in a state of incompleteness. We should disabuse ourselves of completeness because it's a very violent uh, delusions and so on. And incompleteness doesn't mean that you do not enhance yourself through various forms of relationships, various technologies of enhancement, whether individually or culturally or collectively. But it simply means that, that you should introduce an element of humility and not an element of, ah, I finally arrived at, as a supreme being. Now I can turn around and dictate to the environment, dictate to others, dictate and also. No, it's not in that, uh, uh, because uh, uh, the, the fact uh, of, of dynamism of societies, dynamisms of individuals, dynamisms of knowledge production institutions is what leads a curricula to change, to be re-examined and so on and so forth. New generations come and they defy us. We have a generation these days where they have a facility uh, with uh, technolo uh, ICTs, uh, information and communication technologies of various kinds. And we, we, we just, the rest of us who came earlier can just marvel. We try to catch up, but we don't quite. But in our days, just writing on a piece of paper and writing in a straight line was considered to be the highest achievement ever. So we can achieve and celebrate achievement, but we should not delude ourselves that that is the pinnacle of, 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 of things, that that is complete where we become a law now dictating to everyone else how to do things. Thank you so much for that response. That question came from Caroline Hamilton, and, she, and I don't know, but she, and she also wants to know whether there are situations where knowledge is somehow more complete than other times, and is the core on mobility there and then greater? Could you carry through on the theoretical implications of the invocation of incomplete knowledge? Yeah, I mean. Uh... If knowledge is more complete, it's only relative to a particular project for which I require that, no, that knowledge. For example, I, I have a car, and as long as I'm circulating within Cape Town, I'm fine with my car, it solves all my problems. If I want to go to, uh, 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 to Mauritius, no, no, no degree of completeness of my car will take me to Mauritius. I mean, I, 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 I accept I become uh, a, a James Bond and have a flying car uh, that uh, crosses over and then lands after I have taken off. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've reached the border between uh, South Africa and, and the, the Indian Ocean and so on. So basically, knowledge is contextually uh, satisfied, productive. Uh, uh, when uh, in relation to the problems we solve, but quest does not end simply because we have solved a particular situation. So is that I, that disposition to incomplete, and that's why I insist that incompleteness is not something to shy away from. It is actually something to embrace and celebrate. We are so also edgy when it comes to incompleteness. Uh, I, I, I often laugh. I'm not a terribly tall person, but whenever I see people who play hand basketball in a, with, with great uh, 
nimbleness. I, uh, they do a lot with basketball and they earn a lot of money with that. But if it came to bending down to picking a pin from the floor, I think I have a greater advantage in my shortness. I would do that with less effort and less risk to my anatomy. So he's uh, uh, at one level, I might think of him as more complete in terms of height, but when it came to what I can do with my shortness, he cannot rival me. So the, hence the global acumen of incompletenesses, enhancing one another in order to maximize the potency that they seek to become uh, efficacious in the actions uh, and interactions uh, as, as, as uh, whatever that obtains. Um, thank you so much. I hope I, I hope um, your, your 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 explanation would clarify some of the issues for Carolyn. The next question is from Sam Haiki. Please, if I don't pronounce your name very well, I'm sure we are in the right session of incompleteness. So you may just forgive me. <laughs> so the next question is from Sam Haiki. In what ways through what practices can a politics of conviva scholarship overcome the inequalities embedded within current process of knowledge production? Absolutely, that's a very good question. First, it comes by recognizing incompleteness. It comes as a universal and not something that some have a monopoly of or, and some don't or something you can undo in a permanent basis. It comes by recognizing mobility, debt, and indebtedness, which is the key. Many, many knowledge systems around the world have borrowed a lot from others, but they, they try to sweep the debt, the, debt, the debt and indebtedness under the carpet because they want to be tall on their achievements. In fact, taller than they actually are. They, want, they, they, they approach knowledge production or mobility with a zero-sum game of winner takes all. So the, 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 the convivial scholarship that I'm suggesting is one imbued with the humility to know that you can still be celebrated while recognizing your debt and indebtedness. I think uh, you and Andrea uh, have all these fascinating ideas of international collaboration. You, 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 it is a new leaf that you are, you are turning on, 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 on collaboration. But you know clearly that some collaboration of the past have been heavily skewed towards supposedly those who have the resources and those who feel they are taller in terms of years of intellectual achievements and century and so on, and they can dictate to others. That nonsense must stop. Hmm? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just going to, um, I just want to take as many questions as possible. And I'm grateful um, the manner in which you are uh, limiting your responses. Um, and, and I just want participants to know that they can always still uh, write through to you if they need other issues of clarity. Um, I like this question from Mal Malaika uh, Kramer. I love the concept of conviva scholarship. What are your thoughts of someone of your caliber, how to include exclude voices and conversation as we have pragmatic limitations of time? Uh, including voices is basically, uh, you start with your students. You, 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 you don't start by a sense that a professor is always right. Eh? Uh, they, 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 they said it, the professor is always right, it meant even in his sweeping uh, trunk. No, that, that, that is not, uh, you, uh, the classroom becomes a, 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 a venue in which nobody has a monopoly of insights. It becomes uh, a, a, an opportunity to exchange where students can enrich the discussion as, as, as well as you. And even the university becomes too narrow a, 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 a context to uh, debate and find solutions to all of society's problems. Hence the need to have curricula that, uh, reaches, that reach out to the world outside various stakeholders, including those who, whom we only associate with tradition that belongs in the past. Uh, COVID offers a very good example for that where everybody is a possible uh, 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 potential solution to it. 
each in their own way, and you bring them in to this conversation. So uh, convivial scholarship is really about increasing the levels of conversations, intra-faculty conversations, inter-faculty conversations, and taking the academy into the wider society and bringing the wider society into the academy in a serious, structured, uh, open-ended way, uh, and not as if a gesture of goodwill. Um, thank you so much. Um, this other question actually uh, um, speaks to the different portfolios we have held uh, in different institutions. And it comes from Marion Wallace. What role can, does, should publishing play in decolonization? I would be very interested to hear about your experience at Kodesha and Langa. <laughs> I mean, that's a fascinating question. I could dwell on it all day. Uh, uh, I, in Kodesra, I wrote a, a paper called From Publish or Perish to Publish and Perish. It means that the traditional skewed uh, interactions in the knowledge production that have always given the North, global North the upper hand continue to, to uh, to carry the day, even amongst us decolonial scholars. We only come to Langa and Kodesia when every other possibility to publish with the big names out there have, have failed. And we come dictating our terms to them and pushing them to bend over backwards to the point of contortion uh, to publish them as if we, uh, they were doing Langa and Kodesia a favor. Uh, uh, incompleteness and the mobility and recognizing the uh, 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 compositeness uh, of being and debt and indebtedness actually means that for convivial scholarship to work, we must uh, provide more uh, leveling uh, uh, playing field in terms of this uh, 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 publishing uh, and not not only publishing but any any opportunities for ventilating our scholarship our conversations and so on and so forth so what needs to be done and in fact convivial scholarship is an uh, uh, demands on those who have enjoyed power and privilege much more in this case the patriarchs like myself but in other cases, the geographically positioned uh, and the economically well, uh, well uh, positioned and so on and so forth to, 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 to make a, a clear effort in terms of redressing these iniquities and showing that uh, they actually are committed to a more participatory, a more democratic uh, uh, idea of producing and consumption of knowledge. Thank you so much. I'm just going to read this question, which comes from uh, Dr. Monica Otu, but I think she preempted your, your response. So I guess you've already answered, but let me just read it. I'm really enjoying the conversation, Prof. One thing that has captured my interest in what you have said so far is the call for convivial scholarship. Prof, I would like you to provide us with some insight as to the position or current debate, efforts of Northern and Southern scholars in respect to this call for convivial scholarship? Yes, what I can do is uh, 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 send my email address by chat. I have uh, uh, at least two publications which I can share uh, or that develop the idea of convivial scholarship more and, uh, and shows this, uh, this, this, uh, how we could use it in decolonizing the academy. I thank you so much. And I wouldn't want us to end the session without um, clarifying the question from um, clarifying the question which Carolyn Carolyn posed. I think somehow we I miss I misread it out. So she says my question was the opposite of what was read out. I asked, does Francis think there are situations where knowledge is more incomplete, not complete than others? That do you think there are situations where knowledge is more incomplete? Yes, uh, at any given time of the dancing masquerade, they stop to take stock of how much, how much dust from different lands and from different uh, spaces they have accumulated on their feet. And they've been able to examine to see how enriching that dust has been. They, they take stock of the spectacles that they have uh, 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 
taken in as a result of the dance. So I would imagine that the more, the longer your dance, the more you are able to accumulate the capital of uh, from different in uh, interaction with different incompletenesses to enhance yourself. So circulation leads to better enhancement, but it doesn't lead to completeness. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will just take one or two last questions and then the remaining questions can be posed to you on email. And the, the next question come from, comes from Ronel Stein. What structures and interests prevent us from embracing incompleteness in knowledge production practices? I think that's a very good question. Just this morning, I gave, uh, I, I said to Angelica, uh, a, a, a paper I just did on Cecil Rhodes, the, the, the complete gentleman of uh, um, uh, imperial dominance. Uh, uh, and she could share it in the group. And basically, I, I argue that although mobility is central to all what we do, uh, and, and, and although it is often always mot uh, uh, motivated by incompleteness, and then the quest, and that takes you out, it is not everybody who moves in a way that seeks to accommodate other mobilities and other incompletenesses. They move in zero-sum fashion, they encounter others in winner-takes-all, they, 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 they exercise various technologies of dominance in order to maintain power and privilege. That form of mobility is a very violent one. And there's no room for it in convivial scholarship. Convivial scholarship is all about disabusing our, ourselves of the excesses of, or, and the, the, the bloody violence of such types of mobility. Uh, so if, if you want to read more, uh, 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 Angelica will share that paper with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nyamjo. I will just read the last question because I would like you to, I would like to give just a few minutes. Uh, for your concluding uh, 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 comments. The, the last question is from Jennifer Manika. In our journey through apartheid, where mobility was limited and we carry its, eff its effects, recognizing our incompleteness, how do we move forward as a nation to upward mobility and functionality when we are faced with denial or the not knowing? You see, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, mobility, the mobility is made possible or mobility, the capacity to more, be mobile, immobilized, can lead to uh, various conditionings and various cultures. So if you are in a context where your mobility is denied systematically, you also tend to act in those ways with those limited uh, limitations that have been imposed upon you. And uh, from the child, one person's child being only in the womb, it tells you that most of what we become, most of what we celebrate is a result of particular forms of socialization, of particular forms of mobilization, so you can, you can uh, uh, reenact them uh, 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 almost effortlessly. So we can undo that. The whole notion of raising the attention to the possibility of convivial scholarship is that we can con we can begin the process of de de defrosting and re uh, re re reactivating ourselves in tune with an, another form of mobility that is not a zero sum conqueror uh, uh, superiority syndrome type. I, I think I think there's there, 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 it's a it's a very hopeful model. And, and I, I think uh, that, that, that is what uh, I, I, I would like everyone to take away from this. Thank you so much, and Professor Francis. Any concluding comments, remarks? Just uh, incompleteness, mobility, uh, 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 encounters, compositeness of being, uh, debt and indebtedness, and conviviality. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much, um, participants. And I really want to thank those who actually um, sent through their questions. I think their question did enrich the, se the sessions. Um, your questions, they actually uh, <laughs> injected in him the passion 
to engage deeper into some of the issues and issues that we have discussed. So thank you so much for participating. I think we will be moving um, to the next session. Uh, I want to call on, um, where is she, Angelica or Andrea. Um, thank you so much, Professor Francis Yamjo. And thank you to everyone. Our next session will begin um, at uh, 12 15 South African time. Am I right, uh, Andrea? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and I think the link's been sent now through in the in the in the chat. Um, I'll put the uh, the link through again. So come and join the next session with uh, Desiree Lewis and Awino. Uh, yes. I'll catch. So well, thank you so much, colleagues. Please, if you have not registered for the next, do so. Register and join us. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.